Previously we created a couple of standard WLANs. Let's just go into one of those and have a look. We selected a standard usage WLAN and we went through the settings at the top. Now what we're going to do is look at the advanced options. Advanced options are available to all WLAN types. So let's go into the advanced options now and I'll go through a line by line breakdown of what all of these options are and what to look out for when using them. Now there is a lot to cover in the advanced settings so we're going to spread this over two videos. In this we'll begin with the advanced settings that take us up to VLAN pooling and access VLAN and in the second video we'll go from hide SSID all the way down to radio resource management. The first option is the accounting server and this is used in conjunction with the authentication server when you're using WLANs that require authentication of the users. We look at that in a separate module later on. Let's move the window down so that we can see a bit more. Access control is used when we want to restrict what the devices that connect to our WLANs can do. We can control them based on their layer 2 address, their layer 3 address, and we can apply device policies. And we'll look at how to do that in a separate module also. Application recognition and control enables us to view the applications in use by the clients connected to the WLAN. Let's take a look at how it works. It begins with the creation of a new WLAN on the zone director. And as we've seen, the application recognition and control is not enabled by default. So that WLAN will be pushed down to the access point and the clients will connect, but no application recognition takes place. We then go in and enable application recognition and control. And now the access point is going to start to look for the applications in use. As the clients connected to the WLAN start to use applications, those applications will be recorded by the access point. Over time, all of the applications in use will be recorded and that information is passed back to the zone director and you can actually see the application information in monitor applications. We'll look at that later on too. So as we can see, simply enabling application recognition and control will show the applications in use. It's disabled by default, but let's enable it here on our current WLAN so that we start to see some traffic. And of course, once we can recognize the traffic and identify the traffic that's coming through the access points, we can then apply policies to control it. We look at application recognition and control and the use of policy groups in a later module. Call admission control is an advanced quality of service setting that's usually used with VoIP WLANs. The call admission control setting is also dependent on other settings within the zone director. And as this is specific to VoIP WLANs, we won't be covering it any further here. Next comes rate limiting, and rate limiting can be set per station or per SSID. It's also possible to set a rate limit within an application policy or by using AAA. And we'll look at that later when we do application policies. But for now, let's just look at how rate limiting and SSID rate limiting work. Let's begin with station rate limiting. First of all, we create a new WLAN. By default, station rate limiting is disabled. That WLAN is then pushed down to the access point and clients join and operate as normal. We can then select a rate limit and the first option is the uplink. We select a value and the access point now starts to think about applying that rate limit to the stations. Station uplink is then applied to all stations equally. We can also add a per station downlink setting. Once again, once that's applied, all stations will be subject to a downlink rate limit. So let's just look at that then. We'll apply a rate limit here. Let's choose 10 up and 20 down. So you can see that that is relatively simple to apply and it will apply to the WLAN and to all the devices on the WLAN. The next rate limiting that we can look at is SSID rate limiting. Note here the warning that if we apply SSID rate limiting, then the per station rate limiting here will no longer work. Let's look at how SSID rate limiting functions. When we create a new WLAN, the per SSID rate limiting is not enabled by default. So we create a new WLAN, which is then deployed to the access point, and some clients will connect and pass traffic as normal. But don't forget that WLANs are deployed on more than one radio. As a WLAN is deployed in 2.4 GHz, it's also deployed in 5 GHz. So we should expect to see a number of devices also connected on 5 GHz and passing traffic as normal. Let's now enable per SSID rate limiting with an example value of, let's say, 100 megabits. We'll do the same for the downlink. Now, as you can see, we have 100 megabits uplink and downlink as our example here. This 100 megabits 
is per WLAN, so it's split across the two radios. If in this example we have three devices on 2.4 GHz and seven devices on 5 GHz, then the access point will now think about the rate limiting and will split the rate limiting between the two radios. The three devices on the 2.4 GHz will get 30 megabits, and the seven devices on the 5 GHz will get 70 megabits. And so you can see that it's allocated across the two radios, but the amount that we specify here is for the WLAN. So let's just add those values in now. And there we have the SSID rate limiting set for the WLAN, which will be applied over both radios. Next, we have the multicast filter. If this is ticked, then all multicast traffic from clients associated to the access point will be dropped at the access point. Unicast and broadcast traffic will be passed as normal. Next, we have VLAN pooling. So let's take a moment to look at what VLAN pooling actually does, how it functions, and why we use it. We use VLAN pooling in environments where we potentially have a large number of clients that want to connect and a single WLAN, for example, stadiums. Ideally, we don't want to have a situation where we have a large number of clients on the same subnet. So we use VLAN pooling. To use VLAN pooling, we begin by looking at the DHCP server. First, we create a number of DHCP scopes to support the number of clients that we expect to connect. Secondly, on the zone director, when we create the WLAN, we add a new VLAN pool. And this VLAN pool will include the VLANs that map the DHCP scopes on the DHCP server. That configuration is then pushed down to the access point and the WLAN is deployed. The first client that connects the WLAN has its MAC address hashed by the access point which maps it to a specific VLAN. In this case, the first client in connects to VLAN 10. The device is then allocated an address from DHCP pool 10 and that's sent back to the client. The next client connects up and his MAC address is hashed and the result is mapped to VLAN 50. That's passed to the DHCP server. The DHCP server will allocate an IP address from that pool and that's then sent back to the client station and so on. Every time a client connects, his MAC address is hashed and the MAC address hash will always end in the same result. But there's enough diversity between all of the stations that connect to ensure that the spread of IP addresses is balanced across the DHCP scopes. Let's just complete our look at VLAN pooling by creating a new VLAN pool. We'll call this VLAN pool 1. This is for the stadium, as we saw in our example. And the VLANs that we added were 10, 20, 30, 40, and 50. So now we have to select the VLAN pool that we're going to apply. And because we're using a VLAN pool, we also need to enable here on the next line, enable dynamic VLAN. I'm just going to very quickly go down and OK this to apply it. One of the things I want to show you as a result of that is here within configure, if we scroll down under WLANs, we can see a VLAN pooling section. And that VLAN pool that we've just created has now been added to the VLAN pooling section and is available for use on other WLANs. VLAN pools can also be created directly here for use later on. Let's go back then to our WLAN. Another thing to look at now that we have a VLAN pool enabled on this WLAN is this warning here. When set VLAN pooling must disable device policy. And the reason for that is because within a device policy, we can also specify a VLAN. Let's have a quick look. If we look at device policy and create new, we can see under create new again, one of the options that we have is to specify a VLAN for a device type. We'll look at that in more detail later on, but just bear in mind that if we want to use dynamic VLANs based on the device type, we could potentially have a clash with a VLAN pool. So we need to be sure that we understand where the VLAN allocations have been specified and how they're being applied. The final setting we're going to look at in this section is the access VLAN. Well, as you can see, we specified a VLAN pool, which means that we have to enable dynamic VLAN. So let's take the tick out of that box and let's get rid of the VLAN pool. And we can see now that the access VLAN gives us the opportunity to map all the traffic on this WLAN to a specific VLAN. That brings us to the end of this video, the part one of the WLAN advanced settings. Don't forget, we still have some settings to go through, and we'll cover that in the next video.